Amen. I had, I had a thought as soon as I got into my office there about the lesson this morning. So, let's start. 2 Corinthians 11. Look there, my Bible just opens right up to it. Believe it or not, we are almost done with this part here. Almost. 2 Corinthians 11. Let me tie a couple things together that we haven't put together in a while. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 3. But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity of that is in Christ. And the thought that I have this morning on that, less by any means, how many ways is there to heaven? One. How many ways is there to hell? Lots of them. Lots of them. How many religions are leading people to hell? Lots of all of them except one. So you have one versus many. You have one mediator, one Lord, one God, one faith, one salvation, one calling, one anointing, one spirit. All of those things that the Bible says. But then when they say we all serve the same God just with different names, that's true because they are all serving the same God. But not the same God that, that's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So they serve him under many names. How many different fertility goddesses were there throughout the centuries? Maybe hundreds of them. But they're all the same goddess. Uh, how many beast gods did people worship? It, you name the number of beasts, and even in the combination of different animals, you know, like a lion with eagle's wings, they worship that. That's just all these different gods. So anyway, one way to cry, one way to heaven... Uh, Joel Osteen, Oprah asked Joel Osteen, is Jesus the only way to God? And he said, yes, but there are many ways to Jesus. Yeah, and what he meant by that is he believes in including all the religions of the world, okay? Who was it that said, I just heard this yesterday, Billy, I think it was Billy Graham. Yeah, but I'm not positive, but I think it was Billy Graham who said something like that having faith in Jesus is the way to heaven. And he said, I believe that there are a lot of people who have faith in Jesus, even if they're not aware of it. In other words, if they're practicing Islam, according to Billy Graham, they're really worshiping Jesus. They just don't know it. And that gets them into heaven. These people are lying through their teeth. There's one mediator, one Lord, one God. All right, now, uh, verse 4. But I, For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached... Or if you receive another spirit, which you have not received, or another gospel, which you have not accepted, you might well bear with him. The other Jesus, the other spirit, and the other gospel are all tied and linked to, verse 13, false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ and no marvel for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light therefore it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness whose end shall be according to the works now the question I want to ask you this morning is can a human defeat a spirit can a man or a woman, can they destroy Satan? No. Not by their own power. Because the Bible says that angels are greater in might and power. They're stronger than us. They're like one, one species above us. 
similar to the way we are to ants. One ant cannot destroy me. A thousand ants cannot destroy me. That's not saying I want them in my britches. I made a mistake years ago, was at a, a Bible camp in Texas. And I went to bed and I had my clothes laying on the floor next to my bunk. Next morning I got up and I put my blue jeans on and in three seconds I was going, Whoa! it was full of fire ants and they were biting me silly. It's a mistake I'll never make. Shouldn't have been in Texas to begin with, amen. But that, yeah. But we are stronger in might and power than ants. We can kill ants. We can burn them with magnifying glasses. We can do whatever we want to. That's the power that angels or devils have over humans. So it takes something in us in order to defeat Satan. It's what it takes. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. So, uh, let's look at his overthrow very quickly. Turn to Luke 11. Luke chapter 11. This was the verse that just kind of popped in my head a while ago. They are accusing, uh, they're accusing Jesus of casting out devils by Beelzebub. In verse 14 of Luke 11, he was casting out a devil and it was dumb and it came to pass when the devil was gone out, the dumb spake and the people wondered. But some of them, he said, he casteth out devils through Beelzebub, the chief of the devils. And others tempting him sought of him a sign from heaven. But he, knowing their thoughts and said unto them, every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation and a house divided against a house falleth. If Satan also be divided against himself, um, how shall his kingdom stand? Because ye say that I cast out devils through Beelzebub. So he's telling you in this passage here, he's giving you a little piece of the puzzle. How Satan is going to be defeated. How he's going to be overthrown. How he's going to be um, conquered. How he's going to be put into everlasting destruction. So with that in mind, turn to Daniel chapter 2. Daniel chapter 2. Verse 31, this is the dream that Nebuchadnezzar had, and he didn't understand, um, he couldn't remember the dream, and he couldn't have understood it, so he calls for his Chaldeans, his astrologers, his soothsayers and magicians, gives them the task of telling him his dream, and then telling him the interpretation of it, and they said, well, you tell us the dream, and we'll tell the interpretation, and he said, I don't remember it, what do you think I pay you? And so they said, oh, king, it's never been asked by a king to ask his men to tell him what happened in his dream. We can't know that. And Nebuchadnezzar said, well, if you don't know that, you don't tell me what it is, I'm going to have you all killed. Because then I'll know you've been lying to me all these years. And so Daniel heard that. Him and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego went to prayer. Um, God gave Daniel the secret. It told him what the dream was about, told him what the dream was. And so Daniel's then is going to relay this dream in verse 31. Thou, O king, sawest and behold a great image. This great image, whose brightness was excellent, stood before thee, and the form thereof was terrible. This image's head was of fine gold, his breast and his arms of silver, his belly and his thighs of brass. Notice how it gets cheaper in value as it goes down. Gold's more expensive than silver, silver more expensive than bronze. Bronze, definitely more expensive than iron and clay. Um, verse 33, his legs of iron, his feet part of iron and part of clay. Notice that the feet 
are already divided against itself. Because iron and clay do not mix. You cannot weld clay to iron or vice versa. So verse 34, this is how the image is overthrown. Thou sawest till that a stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay and break them to pieces. So this stone is Christ. Christ is the living stone. He's the rock of ages. He's the stone of stumbling, a rock of offense. He is the chief cornerstone. And because he was cut out without using man's hands, that means that man did not invent Jesus. Man did not create Jesus. Jesus created man. It's the other way around. And you talk to the atheists, you talk to the evolutionists, and they say that religion is man's way of explaining what he could not explain scientifically, he just made up a God, a deity, that is that mountain or that tree, or when lightning comes down, that means the gods are sending thunderbolts down from the heavens and so on. They say that religion is the event, invention of man. But this stone, man's hand never, never touched it. Man, we did not create Jesus in our image. He created us in his image. All right? So that stone cut out without hands goes against the feet. Now turn to Revelation 17. You have ten toes. And you have, in Revelation 17, you have ten kings. Revelation 17, verse 12 and the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings, which have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. Uh, verse 13, these have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. So you have ten toes, you have ten horns. Each of those in itself represents dominion or authority. When God told Joshua, Joshua, every place that the sole of your foot touches, that land I'm going to give you. So he has two feet, ten toes, and when he's on land, whatever land he's on, God said, I'm going to give you that land. It's dominion. Ten horns. If you're a buck deer and you have two antlers coming up and a buck deer with ten antlers comes up, Who's going to win? The one with ten. And that's what they use those for. They use them to push out other male deer from the breeding ground. So they can have all the does they want. Sounds a lot like some humans I know. Okay. But anyway, that's the idea of it. Those ten horns represent ten kings. It represents dominion. Law. The law, Romans 7, the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth. And there's ten commandments. So when, uh, let me keep on reading here in Revelation 17, because there's a really good part I want to show you. Verse 14, these shall make war with the lamb. Now I want you to ponder, think about this now, the ten commandments. The ten commandments... Are, and I talked about this Wednesday night. The Ten Commandments are against us. Because they condemn us. That's what Paul said in Colossians. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us. Nailing them to his cross. So the Lamb is at war with the curse of the law. The law is against the Lamb. Works. Let me explain it like this. You remember Hagar and Sarah? Remember those two ladies? They were who bore the seed of Abraham. Hagar first and then Sarah. Paul said in Galatians 4 that Hagar represents Jerusalem, which now is, and her children. So Hagar represents 
those who try to live by the law. And those who try to, listen to me now, those who try to live by the law are always against those who live by faith. Always. Because any time that somebody decides to go Hebrew roots or Seventh-day Adventist, any, any kind of those religions where they say you got to keep as much of the law as you can. Any time somebody does that, they are immediately enemies of those who trust in God for salvation and not their works. Galatians 4, Paul said it. He said, Jerusalem and her children, which represent Hagar and Ishmael, are at odds or warring against Sarah and her children, Isaac and his offspring. And he said, that's how it was back then. So Hagar was always taunting Sarah, saying to her, well, I'm the preferred woman because I bore Abraham children and you haven't. And she was constantly just going at, here, here Hagar is a servant to Sarah. And a servant to Abraham. And yet she now feels that she is of more worth and more importance to Abraham than Sarah was because Hagar bore him a child. And so she starts persecuting Sarah. Sarah then goes to Abraham and says, Abraham, I can't take it anymore. It was a mistake, I get it. But that woman ceases not day and night to persecute me, to mock me. And Sarah said, I want her out. And when Abraham, he grieved over this, he went to God and God said, listen, your wife, put her out. Because the bond child, the servant child, the slave will have no inheritance with the child of the free woman. Those two are not going to the same place. Are you listening? Those two are not going to the same place. And I want to say this, if you decide that law keeping is the road that you're going to choose to reach God, how can I say this nicely? If you decide that that's the road that you're going to take, you can't just take one commandment with you. You have to take all ten of them. As the Bible says, if a man offends the law in one point, he is guilty of all. There is nothing in this Bible that allows for partial law keeping. Nothing. It's either keep it all or keep none of it. But you cannot have it both ways. You cannot say, well, I think God tells us to keep as much of the law as we can. Where is that? Where's that in the Bible? Read that to me. Doesn't exist. So you have thousands of years of history. You have what the Bible says concerning those who live by trying to keep the law or legalist or whatever. They will always be against those who follow God by faith and not by works. And so... When you understand, when you look back at Revelation 17, these shall make war with the Lamb. That is exactly how it is. You see, I don't know if you're aware of this or not, but because you're here today, you have the mark of the beast on you. According to the Seventh-day Adventists. Because you're in this room on this day, you all have, and I do too, you all have the mark of the beast on you. And when I hear that when I've had, I've taken phone calls, I've answered emails. Uh, the last phone call I had about Sabbath keeping, a guy just, and he said, oh, Pastor Mike, I really like, when they start out fluffing me up like that, I'm going, here we go. Oh, I listen to everything you say. Boy, you really got some things good on this, on that prophecy deal. Boy, that's really good. Man, I like you. But why do you go to church on Sunday? And then my question is, why not? Well, you're supposed to keep the Sabbath day. And then I'll go back and read Exodus 20. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou work and do all thy labor. 
And the seventh day, you're supposed to do what? Rest. He didn't say go to church. He said rest. Okay? I'm making a big deal about this for a reason. And I'm not telling you the reason. Okay? But people get pulled away by people who are telling them, oh, you got to keep the law, you got to do this, you got to go to church on Saturday, you got to do this, you got to do that, got to keep the feast days. So if you tell me that you are all about keeping God's law, then I know who you are. You're a liar, number one, because you don't keep God's law. You just think you do. And the ten kings are just like the ten toes, and they make war against the lamb. And the lamb, if you look back in your Bible again, Revelation 17, these shall make war with the lamb, and the lamb shall overcome them. For he is the Lord of lords and king of kings, and they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. If you go back to, uh, where did I have you go? He's Daniel chapter 2. Daniel chapter 2, you'll see Verse 34, thou sawest till a stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay and break them to pieces. Jesus did not, the stone did not attack the head, the chest, or the legs. He went after where the weakness was. The weakness is in the law, the ten toes. Cut off a man's feet and he can't stand any longer. And that's exactly what happened to this image. Once the stone destroyed the toes, the rest of the image just came tumbling down and was broken into dust, blown away with the wind. It's gone forever and not ever coming back. Okay? So, um, well, I just had a thought. Where did it go? Anyway. Yeah. The stone, the stone goes after the toes, and the toes are a divided kingdom. They're the fourth kingdom, but they are a house divided against itself. Because the toes are made up of clay and iron. What do they say? A chain is only as strong as... That's true. There's, that is absolutely true. True. Chain is only as strong as its weakest link. And these toes are weak because they mingled themselves with the seed of men. And when Jesus destroys that image, he destroys the toes. Because now, the, and that's exactly what Jesus said, a house divided against itself cannot stand. And that's exactly what happened. So, when we're talking about Satan's overthrow, that's it right here. You're looking at it, Revelation 17, Daniel chapter 2, uh, Luke chapter 11. All of those together give us what is going to happen in the last days. Satan decides to build an army. And he builds it out of spirits and humans. And humans don't do well fighting spirits by themselves. It is a house divided and it will not stand. Amen? Colossians chapter 2, turn there. Colossians chapter 2. Oh, I like this. Verse 13. Let's back up a little bit. Let's go to verse 9. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. I like that. There are three parts to my body. The head, the torso, and the limbs. Because it said, in him dwelt the fullness of the Godhead bodily bodily we have three parts to us we also have a spirit a soul and a body that's three so no matter how you look at it god the creation in god's creation you can see the godhead so 
He says, verse 10, and you are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power, in whom also ye are circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead, and you being dead in your trespasses, or in your sins, and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a shoe of them openly, triumphing over them in it. And this is all about what defeats Satan. What will be his overthrow? How can you make him leave? It's by way of the cross and nothing else. It's the cross that does it. If you want a picture drawn of this, picture a vampire and a guy holding a cross. Get back. Okay. I mean, it's not quite like that. But it's the cross that destroys the power of the enemy over us. Yes. Satan is going to have your body. But he is not allowed to touch your soul. And he cannot touch that which was conceived in you. Which is that new man. Uh, turn to Revelation 12. Yeah, I like this. Revelation 12. Are y'all awake today? You need more coffee? All right. Wait a minute. No, you're not awake or no, you don't need any more coffee. Okay. All right. Revelation chapter 12. There appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet. Upon her head, a crown of 12 stars. Remember what I said about the feet? They represent dominion. The moon is under her feet. So what does that tell you? Give me your ideas on that. What do you think that means? And I won't kick you out for a wrong answer. Let's make fun of you. What does it mean the moon is under her feet? What do you think? I mean, it means something. But what does it mean? Yes. Okay. Huh? Night. Okay. Yeah, kind of. Yeah. It's the moon is the lesser light that rules over the night. Okay, you're getting close. You're getting close. Ladies. You have a lunar cycle. Right? It actually lasts as long as the lunar cycle does. The waxing and the waning of the moon is 28 days. A woman's cycle is 28 days. Okay? It's, and it's called after the word for moon is what it is. I'm not saying it. Okay? But that's, that's what it is. And that, if you go back to Genesis 3, was part of the curse. Okay? Childbearing and so on. But the moon also is, think of, we have two lights. We have the greater light that rules over the day and the lesser light that rules over the night. Look at your Bible. You have two testaments. One shines brighter than the other. Right? Amen? Are you, are you with me? Sterling, would you go make these people some coffee? Huh? Yeah, yeah you need it more. Okay. Your New Testament. Paul said, when Moses came down from Mount Sinai, his face was shining so bright they couldn't look at it. He said, how much more the New Testament shines more than, I'm paraphrasing, but shines brighter than the Old Testament does. 
So you have multiple meanings of this. The sun's brighter than the moon. The moon represents that which rules over the night. The lesser light that rules over the night versus the greater light that rules over the day. Paul said in 1 Thessalonians 5, we are children of the day and not of the night. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others. So, the moon being under her feet means that through Christ, she's conquered the curse. She has conquered the law, the lesser light that rules over the night. And if I were to say, who's the prince of darkness? Okay, Satan. Because Lucifer means light bearer. Yes, yes, absolutely. She's talking about, scientists figured, discovered this, and I made a big deal about this, because in John chapter 1, he's, John's talking about the light that lighteth every man that cometh into the world, and at the exact moment of a conception of a human, a burst of light comes out of that egg. I went, oh, that is so cool! How, how did man, how did John know that? 2,000 years ago. He didn't. The Holy Ghost did. Okay? But anyway, the lesser light, the rules. Lucifer is a light bearer. The moon, and I don't care what anybody says on YouTube, the moon does not have its own light. It does not have its own light. It is a reflection of the sun. It bears the light from the sun. Does everybody understand that? Okay. And, and the reason why I say that there are people who make this big deal about, oh, the moon's got its own light. Really? Then how come when the earth gets between the sun and the moon, the moon goes dark? Okay. It doesn't. And these same people also say that the moon gives off cold temperature. That the light of the moon gives off cold. And they can prove it. You're laughing, Sterling. They've proved it. They went out at night, took one of those laser temperature things, shined it, it's at night, shined it at a place next to a tree where the moon's light couldn't touch it, and then shined it over in a wide open area where the moonlight was hitting it and they saw a temperature difference. And they said, see, moon, goes, moon gives off cold air. Wait a minute, let's see. The sun was out all day long and it heated up the ground except for where the shade of the tree was. It's cooler. Never mind. Anyway, where was I? Oh. So she has the moon under her feet. John, or excuse me, he, Romans chapter 16 says, May the God of heaven bruise Satan under your feet shortly. Okay? Anyway, Revelation 12 again, let me read it. Because verse 2, she being with child cried, travailing in birth and pain to be delivered. And there appeared another wonder in heaven and behold a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman which was ready to be delivered for to devour her child as soon as it was born. Verse 5, and she brought forth a man child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was Caught up. Underline those two words in your Bible. Caught up. Because those are the exact words that's used in 1 Thessalonians 4. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with him. Caught up unto God and to his throne. So. Uh, so. The moon. Here we have the devil. And he's wanting to destroy what's on the inside of you. But he can't. He wants to try to kill it as soon as it's born. 
but then God rescues it immediately and it's caught up into heaven. Okay? The devil can't touch it. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. And so Christ, through the cross, back at Colossians chapter 2, having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. He takes these things and he nails them to his cross. Now, next Sunday, we'll kind of look into, um, there's different pictures of this in the Bible, but we'll look into Satan. We already saw that Satan has the power of death. He has the power to kill people. He has the power to take life if God permits it. But he has that power. And so we're going to find out next week that the very last enemy that is to be destroyed is what? Death. And he's the one that has power over death. And death was defeated at the cross when Jesus died. Amen? Father in heaven, this Bible is so rich. It is so deep. I love it. I love beholding things, Lord, I've never seen before. I love beholding and being reminded of things that I once knew. And Father, I'll never, never get tired of preaching out of this Bible. I'll never find the end of what's in this Bible. And I pray, dear God, that you would enlighten the hearts and the minds of those who are listening today. And bless those who attended here today. Bless those who are watching from their homes today. Bless those who are gathered together in Samburu and are listening to the Mzungu. I pray, God, that you would open their eyes and let this church be a blessing to them. I love them. Father, you love them more than I do. Bless them, Father, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen, Amen. amen.